much hair on it. So let's see. Any questions about? Uh, yeah, I will get you your article. Um, anybody else has a question about their project? I'm also giving you the option of not participating in this conference because I realized that in the beginning I had said you don't have to present anything. And last year some people were upset that I hadn't laid the guidelines for grades. And we have grown big this year in a graduate class. And my point is these are shifting the rules because you know that's what research is like. So if you don't want to participate, I'm giving you that option. And that's the best I can do. Uh, so, okay, any questions on the condo? I think we are moving on today from this topic. So, any aspect at all? Um, so let me just highlight a few key things. The main thing that we uh, focused on yesterday was the fact that this moment, this local moment, as it interacts with the conduction electrons, leaves its imprint in what is called a condo resonance. Right here. So this sharp beat right here. Which is a big pileup in the density of states at the chemical potential. Now, why are we so excited about that? Because all properties of metals and other things is just determined by the density of states at the chemical potential. So if you're getting a big pileup, it's going to lead to various consequences. And the other thing is this pileup was never seen in traditional copper with manganese or copper with uh, cobalt, you know, the traditional bulk systems. Because it's uh, very hard to see this in spectroscopy. But here, because of this tunneling geometry, uh, it has been observed many times. Uh, and the other aspect is the tunability. So the quantum dot is giving us a few things. So the other thing is quantum dot. Can you go to chair? Are they hard to find now? Quantum dot is first of all uh, allowed us to observe the condo resonance and the second thing is to uh, test uh, the tunability. So Tk is a function of Tk is a function of E0 the epsilon zero, um, EC, and gamma. But it's a single scale. So it's allowed us to test this by just varying so many things about it. And that's actually an advantage of quantum dots even above nanoparticles. So some, some of the people in our uh, department are looking at uh, uh, leads connected to a little cobalt atom. A single cobalt atom. I think that's the kind of talk you heard yesterday. Not what was quite. It? What so was that? he was using an STM to tunnel into this cobalt atom. Ah, so I okay. think you can kind of think of it like this because the tunnel barriers are just provided by the gap vacuum. between the yeah. So that's a vacuum. So here it's some tunnel barrier. There it's vacuum tunneling. But again, in the tunneling density of states, you see a feature. Now the disadvantage of that metallic dot or the metallic particle, or the atom, is uh, you can't use this gate to bring in one level after another. You can tune a few things, like gamma, uh, but you can, it's not as tunable as the quantum dot. This is very tunable, because we can move this level any way we want. Now, one other point I want to bring up before we leave this, and Eric brought it up yesterday. Eric, you want to bring it up now, because that was kind of an important. OK. so. Uh, based on previous discussions, we would have expected that. Um, yeah. So, 
based on what we were talking about before, we would expect that uh, we would have, if we look at this uh, number of current, or right, so let me plot uh, energy and current. Um, so we would have expected, before we were looking at currents, when we were just starting out at the beginning of the quarter, uh, we saw that currents came in delta functions, right, as, func as functions of epsilon. And these happened when epsilon, whatever that filling was, equaled the chemical potential on either side. Right? But here, we've, we're always drawing these energy levels um, much higher, or significantly higher than the chemical potential on either side. Right? And we've been calling or this lower. Or lower. Or lower. Yeah. And we've been calling this um, a virtual state. And my question was, why aren't, why don't we have maximum uh, current when the energy level is here? Why is it when the energy level is not coming right. So that, that's that's uh, that's very important because this is you know there are resonances and resonances. So what we are talking about here is what would be called sort of an ordinary resonance. You have one energy level coming from the lead, the chemical potential, another energy level is exactly in resonance. So that would be something like this. Let's say here is my lead, and this level, if it's exactly at mu, we would say here is a level, level in resonance with lead or with mu. And this is the kind of problem you will study in quantum mechanics. Transmission through, in a situation where the energies are resonant and then you get some transmission, right? So um, to see this condo resonance, it's another regime where if I made, in fact, the condo effect is greatly suppressed. The condo effect, I mean this this sharp resonance peak that I'm talking about. So this effect of just ordinary resonance is what is picked up here. This broad peak. So forget about any condo. Uh, what you would see is I versus E, which would have a width. And this width would be dependent on KT, right? Because uh, the Fermi functions on the two sides are broadened, and this is the kind of analysis we did when we were looking at tunneling. You remember they are broadened, and as a result, you get these broad features, which is on the order of KT. But now, what you're talking about is a situation where this level is actually much lower to begin with. This is in the initial state, so let's focus on the initial state. The level is much lower. And it's only because of some many body effect that there is this additional sharp feature when the two levels are very different. If the two, if E0 became on the order of the chemical potential, you would just get kind of tunneling through a resonance state. You wouldn't get this formation of uh, this many body state. That is able to have, uh, that happens only because this is tunneling much more um, much less frequently. And that sets up this uh, state with a narrow width, Tk. If this width is not narrow, it just broadens into one big uh, broad gamma. Okay, so it, it's formed under special conditions. If you make the tunneling very, very large, which essentially is another way of saying that I, uh, this gamma gets very broad, it will wash out the very sharp feature. Okay, that's another thing. Okay, so that's all there is about the condo effect. Uh, any other questions? Yeah? So um, I was confused about the uh, even versus odd occupancy of the quantum dot. Is is it just that if there's an odd occupancy, then you have essentially like this magnetic impurity, and so you get this many-body singlet, which gives rise to the <coughs> the condo resonance peak, and so you get this enhanced conductivity? Yeah. So the statement there is, if it's an odd number of uh, electrons, or 
on the dot, you will always get a condo effect. If it is even, you may or may not get the condo effect. For example, even if I have two electrons, they could be in a total singlet state, capital S equal to zero, in which case you won't get a condo effect. But if it is in a total S equal to one, you can get a higher order kind of condo effect. So that's the more correct statement. So let me write that. So for n odd, you get sort of the, you get sort of what I would say is s equals half a condo effect. For by that I mean, you know, if you had five electrons, it could be a five half state. So then, you know, there can be some complications of other channels, but I'm trying to keep it simple. So S is half integer, and N is even if S is equal to zero, total S. By this I mean the S of the impurity, right? This S refers to the dot spin. If capital S is zero, which means the two big spins are locked up in a singlet, then you get no condo effect. Because there's no net spin, there's nothing for it to hybridize with the conduction electrons. So there's no condo effect. But if big S is one, you can get a condo effect. You can get what is called a two-channel condo effect. Or let's say you can get a um, yeah, it's called multi-channel. So let me just say multi-channel. Okay. So in a way, this was a very nice example that we saw. Extremely simple to state. I mean, how much simpler could it have been? It could be a problem, you know, a graduate student walks in and you say, hey, you know, I know how to deal with free electrons. Let's put one impurity and why don't you work it out over the summer? And little does he know that, you know, he or she knows that you have to develop fairly sophisticated techniques to get a grip on this. And it's kind of amazing. This little problem can lead to so much excitement for so many decades. Now what I'm going to turn to is another problem, uh, superconductivity, which is another very beautiful problem, in some ways even more beautiful than condo effect. Because in condo effect, we essentially saw a crossover. The system kind of readjusted from a state which had a local moment and smoothly crossed over at some temperature Tk to a state that had no local moment. But you know, nevertheless, there were these sharp resonances and so on. Now I'm going to tell you about superconductivity, which will be an actual phase transition. So that means you go through uh, a high temperature phase, which has, which we understand as just non-interacting electrons, and then you hit a temperature, it will be called Tc, a transition temperature, and below it, the system completely reorganizes. All the degrees of freedom are completely <coughs> different, the ground state is completely different, and the excitations and everything. So you've gone through like a, a what is called a phase transition not just a smooth crossover. Okay, so let's turn to that. So you talk about the difference between crossover and phase transition. So what's the difference between phase transition and critical point? Uh, and critical point? Yeah. Oh, no difference. Phase transitions happen at critical points. So I'll, I'll explain that. and we still need pairs, so it's not entirely a lost cause. Okay, so superconductivity. So let's 
see. I want to hear a bit about what you guys already know about this uh, from various perspectives. So give me some thoughts. And G doesn't get to talk because he's, re <laughs> he's researching this area. In the end, when everybody has spoken, maybe you should add something at that time. Type one, type two. Oh, type one, type two, okay. That comes somewhere here. <laughs> Do you know what it is? So one is a, a complete Meissner effect, and two has a partial Meissner effect. Okay. So you mentioned Meissner effect. That comes somewhere here. Okay. Yeah, Rick. Now let's start at the beginning. Resistance goes to zero. <laughs> Resistance is equal to zero at four T less than T C. How would you measure something like that? You know, what kind of a setup would you have? You know, resistance is zero. So I have a system here. My this is my my system, and what would I do? You know, usually I, you apply a voltage measure of current. So resistance is V over I. Or conductance is I over V. So how would you measure this? So I guess if you, you could put some current in it and then you could disconnect the battery come back sometime later and see how much currents is. <laughs> but then you would have to make a kind of, how would the current just, so you're saying? So I mean, like build, build like a parallel circuit. So there you have some wire and then you have some other, the superconductor stuff on the top and then disconnect part of the battery. And then you okay, draw it, wire. draw it. <laughs> and then I'll even ask you to make it in the lab. <laughs> and then come and see that it works. Um, okay. <laughs> so it's more like, uh, and then whatever superconducting stuff up here. And you put some current in and disconnect the battery here. So you still have current circulating here. Do you buy that? I think maybe if you threw in a capacitor somewhere, maybe. Why? Right. I don't know, like if you, if you set up a <coughs> oscillating RC circuit, but the R happens to be zero, you can watch that somehow. How would you watch? What is the time constant if R is zero? Uh, it should be infinite. Or it should be, if you threw in an extra resistor and you watch the voltage across it in order to measure the current through the, the loop, the only resistance should be from that resistor. But of course then your sensitivity to, the resist, to measuring the superconductor's resistance would be limited by how well you know the resistance of the resistor you use, you're using right. to probe it. Right. That sounds good to me. But you want to add something? Well, I think that is how it's done in practice. If you know you have a superconductor, it doesn't seem like the best way to discover a superconductor. <laughs> you have a trip of wire, I'll hook it up, <laughs> let it run, and then come back later and see if the current's still going. Uh, and it will go for, if you really calculate it, it can go for the age of the universe. And you know, you can keep coming back. Yeah, but, but this is a good setup. Basically, the point is, you want to set up a current source. That's the main point, is uh, that you want to set up a current source. Sorry, somebody had a hand up? Yeah. Uh, I would make some comments here. Yeah. Like, uh, to do this experiment, you need to use four point probe. Because the contact with this is always a problem. You don't know if I uh, your resistance is from contact resistance or not. So, uh, I think so draw that. Yeah. That's but very important. I, I made this experiment more than 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, we are doing like superconducting uh, films. Okay, so let's say this is the superconducting films. So I make four uh, electrical contact like here. here, here. And uh, then I send uh, current into uh, from one contact to the other contact. Is a standard resist like R uh, not here. So there will be some current going through the sample, right? And then you measure voltage. 
So and then you then you can pull down the sample and uh, uh, divide the voltage by the current and the resistance and you plot it in textbook like graph. <laughs> textbook like graph. Yeah. Which is which is. Uh, and it depends on it's a high TC superconductor or. No, just just uh, simple stuff. Yeah. So I, at some at some temperature, it, it will suddenly go to zero. This this of course in the real experiment, it will be have some uh, risk here. This risk is uh, always less than like one hundred millikelvin, very sharp transition. So so you can think that this is a different thing. So. Okay, so this is resistance, temperature, very sharp drop at a temperature that is called TC. Mm -hmm. And the main point here, couple of this four probe is very important because as uh, G said, you don't want to be measure measuring the contact resistance, which is what will dominate, like you were saying, if there's an additional resistance in series, that will dominate everything. So you want to set up a current source. So here's the current source. And measure V. Uh, so measure the voltage drop. Now this is basically our only part of the story. Because, so while resistance as always, as you have seen, Condor effect, um, interference effect, it was always the resistance which gave the first clue. Because that's the uh, standard experiment. But it's not the whole story. Because this is basically telling you that you have a perfect conductor. Okay, that's not the whole uh, bit in, a, in what we mean by a superconductor. It's almost the same thing, but it is what is called a perfect conductor, and it could be achieved even in copper if I remove every bit of scattering somehow. If I removed all the scattering centers in principle, I would get a perfect conductor. But it would only happen at zero temperature under extremely ideal conditions. The amazing thing here is that for T less than Tc, rho is equal to zero. Why? What about all the, what about scattering? From impurities, what happened to that? It's extremely unintuitive. You have the same impurities which were previously producing this kind of a leveling off. And now there is this extremely uh, sharp drop. What happened to all those impurities? Why are they not acting on the electrons? It's the same electrons, but something really amazing seems to have happened, and that's what we mean by a phase transition. So, Meaning that the new state below TC is not some adiabatic continuation of the state above TC. It changed character totally. And that's what we want to go after. So this is um, so this gives a clue that the electrons must have organized must have somehow attained a very different so as not to get scattered by the large number of impurities. And let me just tell you how bizarre this is. Uh, I work in a field, I work a lot with disorder. So uh, this is an aside. So I work on films which are very disordered, 
Okay, so these are very disordered. So let's say something like aluminum films. So much so that the resistance is going up with temperature. That's what it looks like. But even in such a film, which if somehow nothing had intervened, this would have been an insulating film, at some temperature, it does this. It comes this. Okay? So what it is telling you is um, that uh, a superconductor is even more robust than a metal. So in other words, you can have, it's not that you need at least metallic behavior to then have a superconductor. But you could even have a, an insulator and that could still become a superconductor. So the, we're not going to go down that road really in this course, but I'm just giving you a window into just how robust the state is. It can survive all the disorder, all the impurities, which were previously giving you a resistance here, but I'm saying it's actually even more robust. Even if those impurities were driving it into an insulating state, you can, a superconductor can still be born out of that at a low enough temperature. Okay, so this is an aside, some TC, so an insulator um, can go superconductor. So, I don't usually think of aluminum as an insulator. Is, is this the law, this is, the condo effect? As no, this is, uh, this is not. This is, you can take, uh, you can intentionally grow quench condensed films. So you, you know, you deposit, usually we are trying to grow perfect things, but you can take some substrate, like say a glass substrate, and make, you know, deposit atoms of aluminum and just quench, make, deposit them at very fast speed and very low temperature. So these atoms don't get a chance to move around. They are extremely disordered. So the film is extremely disordered. So that same aluminum film, which we are used to thinking of as a good metal, because of so much scattering, it is outside the Drula regime. And it is going through that kind of weak localization effect that we talked about. And this is not even weak localization, it's strong localization due to disorder. So here you can think of strong localization. This is a topic we have not really discussed here, but... But it's similar, right? It's similar. Okay. It's just that that was just the hint of the beginning of the first correction, imagine having so much disorder that KFL was of order one. So this is, the way it's parameterized is KFL is of order one. So that was like a first correction when KFL is, let's say, uh, of order 10 or something. Most of Druder theory works when KFL is about a thousand. So your mean free path is much longer than the wavelength. Now the mean free path and wavelength are becoming, I mean mean free path yeah, and wavelength are becoming on the same order. That's strong localization. So at that point, aluminum starts looking like this, but nevertheless, at some TC, uh, which could be different from the pure TC, at some TC it just does drop to zero. Okay, so what I'm trying to get across is that superconducting state is a very robust state. It's not a delicate thing, you know, just hanging in there, fine-tuned under some conditions, and then you get it. It's very robust. And, yeah. Okay, so we got this Meissner effect. Okay, what else? Have you heard about this? Throw things like superconducting, super collider. I don't know. You must have heard this word in so many. So, so we have like superconducting magnets. Okay. Um, yes. Superconducting magnets. Uh, I should put it here. There are three fundamental mesh scale countries that and the coherent mode. Okay. It has uh, some fundamental constants, yes. So as in everything, we 
should understand what are the fundamental length scales, length scales, temperature scales, and so on, or energy scales, that's better. Okay, any other things come to your mind? A lot of applications, you mentioned the clutters, and I think they use it in uh, like MRI scans. Yes, so all of it is using the superconducting magnet. And this you can see very simply. We just, uh, Howard mentioned that once you set up a loop, a current loop, in a, in a material which is superconducting, the current never decays. So you can imagine if I have a material which is in the form of this loop, and I set up a current, it's never decaying. But this rotating current generates a magnetic field, right, through the center. So this current, by that uh, biot sabat law or one of the, it's just uh, generates a magnetic field, right? And the field has some profile, it decays out. But it's essentially governed by I over 2 pi r. That's, that's the current. So that's it. That's the magnetic field. And because if you try to generate the same magnetic field with an electromagnet, and this, these are numbers you can work out, uh, you can see how much heat will be developed. Say I make an electromagnet with, with copper wire wound up, and I try to pass a certain amount of current to generate a 1 Tesla field, you can work out how much is I square R, and what would be the temperature rise and so on. It'll melt very soon. But with these superconducting, uh, superconducting wires, because there is no dissipation, you can generate up to about, uh, um, in the lab, I think you can get about uh, some 10 Tesla, I think. And then, you know, the high field magnet lab at Florida can go up to about 45 Tesla, 45, 50. And that's a combination, it's a hybrid with a superconductor and an electromagnet. Okay, but those are details. Okay, so that's good. So again, these applications you mentioned in the super collider is coming from the magnet part of it. I don't know how big that magnet is though. Super magnet. Okay, what else have you heard about? Uh, superconductor. Cooper pairs. Pardon? Cooper pairs. Yes, Cooper pairs. So now we are getting fundamental length scales and what is, you've heard about Cooper pairs. Have you heard about vortices? Vortices. No? Okay. So that's another. You know, you've seen vortices in your bathtub. And you've seen that you can get any amount of circulation, right? Just by rotating the water faster and faster, you can get uh, vortices that spin, uh, you know, spin with higher angular velocity. Now, here it will turn out you, in a magnetic field, uh, we will discuss this slowly, but uh, in a magnetic field, you can get vortices. So it kind of comes around here. And these are really important. All the magnets we use for applications are ones that have vortices. And what I'm going to tell you, which is even more bizarre, is that the more disorder you have, the better magnet you get. So if you don't have any disorder, actually it's a bad superconductor. It won't give you the zero resistance state. Okay, so keep this very strange statement in mind, and we'll come back to discussing that when we get to some of these topics. Any other? G, now you want to add something? Uh, so there are some fundamental theory, like PCS theory and the King's Brother London. Okay. Yeah, so now we are going to really enter the, the work. Yes. Um, actually, before, so you know, he, he mentioned a few things. So we will do uh, some of the theories in some, uh, some kind of a, not in all detail, but in, at some level we will look at it. But let me give you a backdrop of where we are headed, because we have a limited amount of time, and I want to tie it up with our uh, nanoscience uh, class. So we are going to go in the following way. 
Um, so this is kind of the rough outline. I'm going to start out by giving you an order parameter. <coughs> So basically this theory says, well, we have a phase transition. Something was at high temperature, it was normal, and below Tc, we have a new state. Whenever, there's an, uh, whenever there is a phase transition, there has to be some order parameter which describes that. So this is a very general theory which we will discuss. And it will bring us to many beautiful concepts. Um, it's generally known by Ginsburg Landau theory. And then we will come to um, we will come to a vortices very quickly. Vortices. And I will describe sort of a I think, yeah, let me leave that. And then I will discuss something called Joseph, uh, no, something called tunneling, which we've been talking about. But we'll look into tunneling into a superconductor. Tunneling into a superconductor. <coughs> and then we will look at another. So this is electron tunneling. Right? We bring a tip and we try to push an electron into the superconductor. And it will turn out uh, that in a metal, as you know, if I try to push an electron into a metal, there's no problem. There are lots of states above the chemical potential. So that if I'm sitting at the chemical potential, I can add an electron, no problems. In a superconductor, we will see there's actually a gap. You can't push a single electron into the superconductor. But rather remarkably, you can push a pair of electrons. I mean, it's absolutely bizarre. One electron won't go in, but two will, with zero resistance. So then we look at pair tunneling. This is also called Josephson tunneling. And this leads to uh, these extremely important devices called squids. Have you done more than just eat them? <laughs> Super, what is it? Superconducting quantum interference device. It's based on this principle. And then I might come to a superconducting quantum dots. quantum dots, and also Cooper pair boxes. And this is playing a big role right now in quantum information. <laughs> okay, so that's the broad plan. So, any questions? Anything you'd like me to add to this? What you see here that is missing is, okay, let's talk about a few uh, important time scales on this. Again, like we wrote down for um, Kondo effect, the first time it was discovered. This effect was discovered in um, 1911, that far, even older than Kondo. And the subject is still not dead. In fact, it's had a major revival in recent years. 1911, <coughs> Kammerling, Ohms. And he discovered uh, superconductivity in in 
Mercury. Mercury. Now, as a kid, I got to play a lot with Mercury. It's very poisonous. But I don't know if you've ever seen this stuff. You know, you have it. We used to get it in these thermometers. And we had to do our lab experiments and, you know, put it in and measure temperature rise and some specific heat measurements. And we used to purposely drop that thermometer because then you could see this mercury running all over, globbing up. It was really fun. But anyway, that stuff, he got to play with it big time. And um, luckily, they didn't have safety laws at that time. So, but he got to play with it really big time. And what he was looking for was the following effect. He had an assistant, and he's, his idea was, if you take things like copper or any metal, and you cool it, he was hoping to see atoms or electrons become sluggish. You know, and that's what you would expect. You're taking the kinetic energy out of them, and so they, they should get slower and slower and become something like honey or molasses. And that's kind of what his idea was, that it should, the resistance should kind of become infinite because it should become very viscous and not move. And it's very fair enough. That's a very good picture. Instead, his um, assistant did these experiments and the reason I bring up the assistant is he was kind of mad with him because then he didn't get what he expected. So it's well documented, this stuff. So he had his uh, assistant look at various things. And you know this was gold with various amounts of impurities. So he could see this curve shifting around depending on the impurities. And then you know this kind of remained at the lowest temperature. And then he took mercury. And mercury did something like it came down, and then suddenly, at a temperature of about, uh, I want to say 4 Kelvin. Do you, do you remember the exact temperature? No. Right. That's what I remember. I seem to remember this was around 4.2 Kelvin he saw this very sharp drop in mercury. And he was not happy because he wanted to see this becoming infinite. Instead, it became zero. Um, but this turned out finally, uh, it, the results stood. Many people tried to repeat it. And this was the first discovery. And some of the other things he tried didn't seem to ever come down. And even to date, have never, never gone superconducting. So gold, silver, copper, even today, have never, people have pushed it down to micro Kelvin temperatures, and these haven't gone superconducting. So if we look at what does and what doesn't, um, there's a nice table. You should look at it in Ashcroft and Merman. And there are a whole host of elements that will go superconducting. And there's no kind of rule for that, but typically magnetic systems will not go superconducting. So if you look on this, you see, OK, there's a manganese, copper, iron. Those don't go superconducting. None of the insulators have really gone superconducting. And, but then there is some class of metals that have. And copper, silver, gold are singular in being very good metals, but not superconductors. You know, you start to form this picture that to have a superconductor, you must have a metal, a good metal then it's possible that it might superconduct because that requires a higher level of conduction. And this uh, will break down. This, this idea breaks down, actually. But OK, so this was the first experiment. And the theory, again, came very much later, in 1957. So the theory came in uh, 1957. Uh, it was the Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer, BCS theory. Bardeen uh, was a, a professor at UIUC Urbana, and Cooper was his postdoc, and Schrieffer was his grad student. And they put together a very, uh, a microscopic theory. 
And by microscopic, I mean they were able to take a Hamiltonian, like we tried to write down for Condor effect, SD kind of Hamiltonian. Here it's a different Hamiltonian. They were able to identify what are the key terms that should go in the Hamiltonian. And it turned out that the key term was a kind of attraction between electrons. Right? You know electrons repel. That's Coulomb repulsion. But what they were able to show is that, um, and none of this is, uh, we cannot go into this here, but they were able to show that because of the presence of the lattice and the polarizability of the lattice, one electron comes in and you know, scatters off a phonon, so these wonderful phonons that we discussed last quarter, and then another electron comes and interacts with that same phonon a little time later. And this interaction can effectively be attractive. So they were able to construct a very simple model, which I will work out for you uh, with just the effective attraction in it, without going into the mechanism of that attraction. That's a bit complicated. But if you just take a Hamiltonian p squared over 2m, and another term that has an attraction term between two electrons, they were able to get the wave function of the ground state, which basically describes the ground state of this superconductor, and they were able to get the essential temperature scale, so the analog of the condo scale, Tc, from their calculation. So it's a very nice calculation, and it's at, at one level it is doable. And the level that is doable is, is what is called a Cooper problem. So Cooper basically solved a simple version of that. And on Tuesday, I'm going to work that out. But anyway, this theory came in 1957. And again, I'm going to point out, when we do the theory, why it took so long. It sounds uh, simple, but uh, actually getting a grip on that problem theoretically took so many years. Okay, and then, um, actually, yes. so then came, uh, I want to just, uh, this particular, okay, yeah. Um, so the place where this Ginsburg Landau comes in. I forget the year of that, but Ginsburg Landau. So this was, you can write down here, a microscopic theory. <clears throat> Ginsburg Landau took a different point of view. And I forget when that was. But uh, they took a different point of view. This was a more... Um, sort of a, a more macroscopic, or you can call it an order parameter theory. Okay. By that I mean they did not care about all the details. What are precisely the electrons doing and all that. They didn't go down that route. They said, well, if you have a phase transition, it must generically behave in a certain way. And they just proceeded with that answer. And they were able to get, make a huge amount of progress. So I thought, for our class, that's what I will do. Because the microscopic theory is a vortex in its own way. It will suck us deep into second quantization. And you know, it, it's a world in itself. Beautiful world, but we have to wait to, to enter that some other time. OK. So I'm going to, through this Landau theory, or Landau-Ginsberg theory, see how much we can squeeze out. Um, actually, to put it in context, you know, it sounds like maybe everything finished around 1960s, right? Because we had a theory, we had an experiment, and maybe it all ended there. But the saga really goes on, and it had a major revival around 1986. This was the discovery of high temperature superconductors. And
and the main point here is high Tc. So this temperature, Tc here, was, uh, you know, so people tinkered with it for many years. You know, between 1911 and all that, there was plenty of time. And what were they doing? They were, you know, looking at different elements, and then you move from elements to alloys, niobium nitride, etc., and you can raise Tc a little more. The maximum Tc people had gotten to was about, so here is temperature, Tc versus time, and it sort of, you know, went from 1911 around like 4 Kelvin, and it kind of, did, no, zero there, it kind of went up like that, and this is 1986, and it had kind of marched up to about 20. And then there was this big singular event. In 1986, it went to 40. And that was a very momentous day. Uh, I think, were most of you born at that time? Yeah. Maybe not. No, you were, okay. That's when in 86. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I was a grad student at that time. I was just finishing. And we had this event in the March meeting. It was called the Woodstock of Physics. Woodstock, and it literally was bigger than Woodstock. I wasn't there at the time of Woodstock, but I can imagine um, it was more riotous than any Woodstock would have been. The room was packed. We had to wait for three hours to get into the room. And then people were describing some black material and getting all excited about it. And somebody was saying, no, the green one does this. And you know, nobody had much of a clue, but the air, it's like even the real Woodstock. You don't really know you know, they're just there, and it's the, more of the atmosphere. So it was a bit like that, we were caught up in that. And if you looked at the data, so this is what I say, the first data is in the eye of the beholder, literally. And it looked a bit like this. I'll show it to you sometime. Um, you know, it sort of came down, and then, you know, it's kind of like this. Not very sharp, and it's sort of coming down, and this temperature is around 40 Kelvin. And there's a lot of this, and it's not even zero, it's kind of doing something like this. And of course, you know, the people who have discovered it, they're like, oh, you know, we see a superconducting phase. And then there are others who are like, well, you know, it, could it be a mixture of two things? And a lot of controversy, controversy there. But what was, this data was very quickly uh, modified, uh, very quickly experimented on other classes of materials. And today, I'll cut a long story short, it is somewhere there at 160 Kelvin. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the excitement. It went from 20 to 160 in just a few years. But the bigger excitement was the class of materials in which they found this phenomenon. It is, um, uh, it is so the materials were very unusual. And it had, it basically had uh, things like lanthanum, copper, and oxygen. Okay, it started with some parent material of this kind. So, and these materials were actually ceramics. Okay, so that's the first strange thing. You would have expected a good metal to have become such a great superconductor, but these were ceramics. And you had to do some chemistry. You had to do some chemistry tinkering of cooking, literally cooking, you to bake and shake and bake these in, in, a, in, a, in an oven. Like La2 minus X, strontium X, copper O4. So you basically had to replace a 3 plus iron by a 2 plus iron. Anyway, these are details, but all I want you to extract from here is that these were insulators, whopping good insulators, not just like silicon with a small gap. These had a gap of about four to five, four times silicon. So these are big insulators, big time insulators. Ceramics and turns out to be insulators with a gap about four EV. Then you do a little bit of tinkering. You uh, change some atoms by like few percent, 0.01 to 0.1 
x, x is like 0.1 or 0.2, and you start to get a superconductor. Okay, so you do this, and then that drives the system into a superconductor. So that's the first thing. Um, so it basically, um, and I won't go into it because it's actually um, it's mind-boggling in terms of how it has actually challenged three major paradigms we have all grown up with. One of them is band theory, which tells us when is something a metal and when is it an insulator. And we all know if your band is half filled, it should be a metal. Well, these are half filled bands. So they should have been a metal, but it's a big time insulator. So challenge that. Second thing it challenged was it could not be described by the microscopic BCS theory. Okay, second comfort zone was out. Then the third thing, we expect, you know, we've all been talking about Fermi liquids, right? And then we talked about how the susceptibility is constant at low temperatures and so on. So Fermi liquids have certain characteristics. And when they are not superconducting, like above TC here, these are just good metals, and they have certain properties that we associate with metals. These, above TC, were not metals at all. They were strange objects. They were not insulating, they were not metals, but they were something in between, now called pseudo-gap states. So you can imagine just how much excitement came with just this one discovery. Okay, so that's 86, and then, I'm bad with dates, but, um, especially as it gets closer to, to home now. But, um, you know, then it seemed, okay, these were really exotic, and we are done with exotica. But more recently, I think maybe five years back, um, uh, these iron compounds were discovered. So now you have, let's just put down some date, like 2000, we have what are called nictites. Can't even pronounce this, because it has this funny P there. But that's supposed to be silent, but nictites. And this stuff has iron in it. So again, one expects magnetism to not be anywhere around. Remember, copper by itself does not go superconducting. In that context, it does. Here again, iron does not go superconducting. But in some complicated oxide structure, it has oxide as well, it does go superconducting. So, you know, many. Uh, so it, it obviously leads to, ultimately, where are we? What it is pointing to is we don't, in general, understand all aspects of superconductivity. Otherwise, we would be predicting much more and explaining much more. So that's kind of where we are. Now, what we are going to do in the course is sort of go through the Landau-Ginsberg theory, get some basic aspects of superconductivity, and then bring it I won't deviate from ordinary superconductors, like aluminum and so on, but we will go toward the limit where they become small. So we can ask what kind of new effects happen when we get dots made out of these, uh, you know, seemingly well understood superconductors. Okay, but I thought I should give you this overview first. Yeah. So these materials, uh, are any of these sort of decisions to fabricate a material like that informed by theory, or do the chemists come up with a new material and hook it up to Howard's device and say, hey, we've got a super connect? Yeah, it is. Theory is very far. Even after 86 to now, it's uh, 20 years, 20 odd years, 25, uh, theory has not been able to explain completely. So... Right, it just seems like, I mean, how random is this material? Like, how do you even... No, so, start? Right. So people are never doing this for the right for, for the actual reason that they are found for. So it was discovered by Bednoz and Mueller, and they were looking for dielectrics. They were actually interested in ceramics with certain uh, high dielectric constants. Okay, so that was their focus. And they were hoping to look for dielectric properties. But suddenly they discovered that it was actually superconducting. So it was for that reason. And in fact, there's an interesting story about these guys. They were not supposed to be working on these materials because nobody thought this was of any use. The, the, these are called um, 
these are actually what are called perovskites. These are perovskite structures. And I will show you the structure at some point. But basically what it has is um, an, a copper atom surrounded by a cage, oxygen cage. Like this. It's like this kind of an octahedral cage. And so these structures, they were kind of investigating that. And people didn't think there was much promise in that. So they were in um, IBM Zurich and working under the table. This was not part of the management agenda at all. They were working under the table on this topic until the day they got this, they made the discovery and then, you know, won the prize and so on. But now, so here's, um, here's uh, the interesting thing that these perovskites have since been found to be uh, amazing quantities, of, uh, amazing structures on the brink of many other phase transitions. You know, so it turns out if you make a big plot of um, perovskites, generally perovskites, and one classic example is barium titanate. Uh, barium titanate uh, is a similar kind of structure in a cube. You know, you have titanium sitting in the center of the cube, surrounded by uh, bariums and oxygens. And this is a perovskite structure. And it turns out to be, um, it has very interesting ferroelectric properties. Then there are others which might have ferromagnetic properties, or this one which has superconducting properties. Mm -hmm. So they are all on the brink of some kind of an instability. And you know they have huge responses at that instability. So in a way, um, which instability? Um, so, so the first thing which is interesting to ask, why is the metal undergoing an instability of some kind? And that's a useful way to start this discussion. We have a metal. It has some energy or free energy. Why does it want to become unstable? When you say you have a phase transition, the system is going from state A to B. There has to be a thermodynamic reason to do that. And it has to happen that at uh, low temperatures, the superconductor has to become more stable thermodynamically than the metal. And what is the reason for that? Okay, so we will, we will discuss that. And that's kind of how we understand phase transitions uh, in terms of thermodynamic stability. Any other comments? So what's used most commonly, just in like a lab superconductor magnet? Um, those might even be um, like niobium. I don't know, you should tell, tell us. Uh, it's still a traditional BCS superconductor because the pupates are like ceramic, like it's like brittle. Um, Another good use for uh, magnet. as it yes. still. So, you know, initially there was this huge excitement. We've solved the world's uh, energy problem. You know, we have a 160 Kelvin, well, we are yay close to 300, you know, like halfway there, kind of thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we just need to raise TC a little more, and then we will have uh, these currents flowing through these high temperature superconductors. Well, they are ceramics. So there's a huge amount of work, even at OSU, in the materials department, where they are trying to make wires by embedding these in a matrix of silver or copper or what have you. And various devices are coming online, like I think uh, for. Um, some of these cell phone applications in terms of filters. These are very good filters, high DC things. But they haven't yet found like a major uh, niche because it has to also be economically viable. That's the other part of it. I will try to put out an article on um, by uh, Scalapino and Manhart on, it's a Physics Today article on where is high TC being applied today. Uh, I think we should know more about it. Okay, anything else? Maybe this is not a bad uh, stopping point. And then next time, I will start with the, uh, with the, with the order parameter theory. Okay.